Okay, thank you very much for having me. I'm Akima Paul Lambert. I am an international counsel. Um, it's a very fancy way to say a salary partner here at Double Voice and Plimpton. We are in my offices right now, and um, I also double up as um, Grenada's ambassador to the Holy See. Um, that's the Vatican. So I have a dual role, and there's a lot of duality about me, which I think we might discuss or touch on in this interview. Okay, so I was going to go through like the question, but straight away you've said something that interests me straight away. So yeah. your role, your ambassador, ambassador role, what does that actually involve? Well, that? when I was approached, I remember telling um, the, the, the individuals who approached me, I said, what exactly is it that you'd like me to do? And what I've found out and what my objectives are in this role is actually to be part of a Caribbean coalition where we actually petition and um, assist the Vatican in relation to um, human rights issues and climate change. Both issues are very, very important to me. So I've been having meetings, I've been meeting people who are interested in these issues, and I think the church is in a very singular position where it can actually have a significant effect because it's it's it, it really holds a lot of power, particularly in Latin America and the Caribbean. And we've been looking at ways that we can harness this power for, for the greater good. Um, something as well that has come to the fore is the church's treatment of child sexual abuse, not to touch on a very heavy topic so early on, but we've also been dealing and working with the individuals on the commission that has been set up by, um, by the Pope. And this is something that we hope um, to help to bring closure to many people who have been affected in the Caribbean because we've seen so much happen elsewhere um, and um, we don't want the Caribbean to be forgotten about in light of all of that. So that's what I've been doing um, in my free time when you ask me about hobbies. Okay, all right. <laughs> but it seems as, as if, like, touching back on the environmental issue, yeah. that's not something that's new to you. It seems like that's something that you've been interested in since a youth. Well, I'm sure you worked on a particular program. You was um, elected to be in a particular program when you were young to do with environment. Yeah, so um, I always had a keen interest in social issues and social justice. Um, and actually, I thought when I left law school that I would be a human rights lawyer. I mean, it wasn't really meant to be um, for various reasons, which I can explore. But I started off in Friends of the Earth Grenada, and a child is the product of its environment. And obviously, in Grenada, the environment was just very close to me. It's very real to me. And the effect of climate change, the effect of the ozone layer depleting, it was real to me and urgent to me in a way I felt that um, it's not necessarily urgent when you live in a, de develop, in a developed world. So it, it was very real to me, and I was given the opportunity to join Friends of the Earth by a very dear friend, Mr. Joseph Antoine. I mean, he really pushed me forward, encouraged me with my writing, and encouraged me to take a lead role in the organization. I think at age 11, I was already on the board of the organization as a second vice president. So it was really unprecedented, but he really encouraged that in me and really gave me that opportunity. And I'm, I'm always grateful for that because it, it certainly planted a seed in respect of concern for my environment and, and concern generally for others because I think climate change is really about concern for the next generation and um, I'm really grateful as I said for having had that mentorship and that opportunity. So in terms of Grenada have you seen there's been steps towards actually thinking about climate change and how we recycle how we deal with things that are, what kind of um, materials and chemicals we're, we're using in Grenada in terms of Yes, actually, and I think there's been a big shift. And I know contemporaries of mine, um, I'll mention Sophia Sony. Um, she's been working on a lot of initiatives. There's a blue initiatives. And what brings me great joy is that people that I know are actually now leading the way and leading the mantle on these initiatives. And one of my friends is a PhD graduate from Trinidad, and she was recently in Grenada and telling me about all these marvelous initiatives with the coral reefs, the saving of the turtles. I think we're, we've now banned plastic in containers. So there are measures. I think progress is slow, but there are measures that have been taken. And I'm pretty pleased, even considering um, the specific issues that face Grenada in terms of capacity and infrastructure, I think they've actually been doing a, a fantastic job so far. There's a lot that remains to be done, but I think 
in terms of progress, they, there's certainly a lot of measures that have been undertaken um, in the meantime. Okay, so the first thing that comes to mind is that we have this person, I'm speaking to this person right yeah. now, from Grenada. Yes. And I'm thinking to myself that we're in the middle of the centre of London. I'm not saying migration is the key to success, mm -hmm. that at all, mm -hmm. but you are in a building that obviously reflects the high calibre that you aspire to. Now, the thing, what, I'm, what comes to mind now is your adolescence and your youth and growing up. And mm -hmm. before we started talking, we started talking about um, role models and school, schooling. Mm -hmm. For you growing up, how did your environment shape you and what people were particularly supportive? Well, a lot of people say, you know, and so one of the questions I think that comes to mind is, were your parents academics? Because you seem really academic. But um, I would like to say we were always academically ambitious. My mother, um, I grew up watching my mom work her way through um, her accountancy exams, um, working and studying at the same time. I used to accompany her. Um, I also had aunts and who were teachers. I had family members who were professionals. And they took a very keen interest in my ability and in nurturing. And I think that was the making of me. Um, I was very fortunate at my primary school to receive support from all of the teachers there. They were very supportive of me. And again, I think when I went to St. Joseph's Convent, um, we had I had really excellent teachers. I had Ms. Dubois, who's been a champion for me um, her whole life, literally, and um, Sister Gabrielle Mason. These are only two of the teachers that really were impactful. But if I started naming names, I had Nicole Phillip, who literally took it on herself to teach me um, history when she learned that history class with chemistry and she she wanted me to be able to, to do history and she literally took time, of, time out of her schedule to individually give me lessons at no cost. Um, I had, you know, Miss Pilgrim, I was on the track team and I was doing athletics and I was doing um, well at all my other extracurricular activities. I had, again, in Sister Gabba Mason, very supportive of my poetry and my writing and my chorus speaking and my speeches. I mean, I had the most incredible support network that you could ever think of. And they were supportive of me. They nurtured my talents. They encouraged me to fan the flames of the things that I was passionate about and the things that I was, um, that I had a, a, an obvious and innate talent in, and even to work on those things that I did not have an obvious talent in. So I was, I was extremely lucky, I think. I think when you plant a seed, it needs to be on fertile ground, and I was certainly on very, very fertile ground in Grenada. And a lot of people ask me, they say, well, in England, you're, you know, I have a son now, your child would get a better education. And I say, what is better? Better is an education that allows you to be holistic, to have a holistic approach to life that will teach you the relevant skills. It's not just about A, B, C, one, two, three, and learning Latin. And I think I genuinely had the best education in Grenada. I think I learned about life. I think I learned and I was led by example. I think I learned about decency, about humility, about initiative. I, I genuinely believe that in Grenada that I had one of the best education or the, what, I struggle to say the best, but it, it was to me the best educational start that that a child could possibly have. Okay. You mentioned um, whilst you were talking about the people that supported you about writing. Yeah. yeah. Now, how important was writing to you and what impact does it have on you today? Well, I absolutely loved reading as a child and to me writing was an outlet. It was a way to harness my creative energy. I became a Calypsonian. And I think primarily because I liked writing and I liked that creative process. And I believe it was Walcott who said, you know, in the Caribbean, we don't really have a very strong written tradition, but we have a strong oral tradition. And I felt that, you know, my writing was a way to, to bridge the gap. And I felt that my childhood was just punctuated by really colorful stories and colorful characters. And I wanted other people to, to hear and to feel those characters. So even now, when I tell my husband, because my husband and I both grew up in Grenada, but he had a very different childhood. Um, he lived in the town and I live in the countryside. And my childhood now, when I go back, it's exactly as I left it. The characters may have changed, but the whole, I think the heart of it is essentially the same. And I think writing allows, allowed me to capture that heart. And... Um, 
I look back at it with with such fondness because I think because I was, you know, I, I I was studying a lot. I loved you know reading and I loved learning, but it really gave me a, a positive outlet to actually imagine and to let my imagination free. And I think it's a foundation for everything I do now. I am a lawyer because I like to write. Um, I use my written advocacy all the time in my role um, and as a lawyer and for the firm. And you also, I know, you also won an award for writing, if I remember correctly. Did I? <laughs> at 15 years old. Oh yes, I did actually. It was the same, front with, again with Friends of the Earth. Um, mm -hmm. I wrote an article about environmental pollution and what young people should be doing. And it did win um, the United Nations Award. Um, I don't think I understood the significance of it. I think I was invited to Moscow for the ceremony and I declined because I think I had exams at around the same time. But um, it was a very significant moment. I remember it very clearly. And again, it was one of those things that really boosted my confidence as a teenager growing up in Grenada. Okay. There's an academic by the name of Peter A. Roberts. Mm -hmm. He actually lives in Grenada now, but he didn't live in Grenada originally. Mm -hmm. And um, he talks about, the, you, you just mentioned it yourself, the oral culture and moving uh, kind mm -hmm. of across to a liter literacy kind of culture. Mm -hmm. So you actually dabbled in both, as you mentioned yourself, you were a Calypsonian. Mm -hmm. Now, what, what made you want to take that route into music? And also, you, that was something that you was also successful at in more than one country. Yes. So, so tell, tell us about that. Well, I've always dabbled. I would say I've dabbled in Calypso. I don't think I'm a natural singer. I can sing. I was part of the school choir, but I wouldn't describe myself as a, as a singer, but I would describe myself as a writer. Um, again, as I keep saying, child product of environment. My uncle, um, Rafa Paul, he was a Calypsonian, and then um, my cousin at the time had taken part in a female calypso contest and she won and I was one of the actresses on stage you know creating the presentation and I've always loved calypso I used to beg my mom to take me to Dimash Gra I've, I I I love the stories I love the double entendre I love the the irony I love the putting together of the melodies and I love the history of it. I think it's one of the things that we can be really proud of as Caribbean people. We're the only country where we have political humor encapsulated in song. Most other countries, they have love songs, they have songs, but none of the, no, no there's, there are no countries I've met that would be entertained by a political song. And I think this is such a unique selling point of our culture that I found it fascinating as a child. It's only now that I dissect it that I, I realized why I found it fascinating because it was clever, it was entertaining, it was funny, it was humorous, and it was a competition that allowed it to be fresh um, and, 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 and hugely popular. It was hugely popular when I was growing up. The match girl was not, it's a shell of itself now, but it was very popular. So I think all those elements appeal to me, and I'm a performer. Um, it's the reason I'm a lawyer as well. I'm a writer, but I love performing. And it just seemed like a natural extension of myself to move from um, performing a piece of poetry to performing a song. Um, and I was encouraged again by my school in doing it. I was a part of the, 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 the Catholic tent. I was very big in my church back in the day, and the, my church had a Calypso tent. And I was part of it. It was called the DYC tent. And that's how I started. And we were like a family. We moved up and down the country. We'd have our Calypso gigs. We'd have our tents. And then I moved on from that into managing my own children's Calypso tent. So I think, again, it was one of those things that built my confidence. But it was really a natural extension of all of the things that I was already doing in, in Grenada and, and, and all of the things those things that were imbued in me from my cultural references and points of view. The scholarships, um, tell us a bit about that and how you actually attained yeah. this achievement. Yeah. So, um, I, thanks again. When I was at St. George's Convent, I did incredibly well. I got, um, I won the regional awards. So for GCSEs, I was a student in the entire Caribbean who did the best um, by the CXC governing board. So I was invited to Jamaica. Now they give a scholarship um, to UWE if you win this award, but at the time they didn't. Um, so my only hope, and I was not born with a golden spoon in my mouth, you know, I knew that I had to get a scholarship if I wanted to attain um, 
in any way. Uh, my family would have been able to help, but I think it would have been very, very difficult. So I put my head down when I went to A-levels. I literally, my goal was to get this island scholarship. Um, and in a way, it, you know, it was a product of my hard work, but I think it was also a product of a lot of people also helping me. Um, I remember I went to Tam CC and at the time I had, um, we didn't have a Spanish teacher um, and one, again, Margot Dubois in St. George's College, she arranged for me to have private tutoring because I just didn't have a teacher. Um, we had teachers who went absent who were teaching math and I had to teach myself math. And then I had very good people like Jeff Jeremiah who still runs a math club, you know, really just volunteering his time. Um, so it was it was a very difficult, arduous route, but I remember two of us actually got really good grades. I got all A's, and there was someone else who got all A's, and then there was a um, a decision to be made because at the time now there's more, but there was only one island scholarship. Who do you give? It? Who do you <laughs> yeah. give it to? Wow. Um, and I did four. I think she did three, and then they had to do it on three, and it it was just a complicated decision. And at the time, the current prime minister of Grenada said, "I'm going to give two island scholarships." because I think the two people who actually deserve it this year, they did exceedingly well, and I want to make sure that they both get to go to university. Mm -hmm. So again, you know, you would say serendipity, but I would say, you know, it's just a perfect alignment of things, and um, that's why I always speak highly of Dr. Mitchell, because he didn't have to do that, but he did. And um, it makes me really happy now that, you know, his investment <laughs> and his faith in me hasn't been proved wrong, but um, it explains why I think, you know, you do the work, but I think sometimes you also need um, a bit of help and a bit of push. And I'm, and now I'm very focused on reverse mentoring. I'm focused on helping. I'm, I'm focused on financial assistance because I really want to give back in the same way that I think um, others have given to me. As an adult, well, young, not an adult, teenager, I, said, I suggest um, that you went to, you ended up at Cambridge. Yes, so, I did. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> ending up at Cambridge, that's quite, uh, uh, obviously, an uh, exceptional achievement. Well, it, it was actually, I didn't intend to. I never, when I was a kid, I never knew of Cambridge in that sense. The only way I knew about Cambridge was the Cambridge A-level exams. Mm -hmm. It didn't dawn on me that you could actually go to Cambridge. And I think I saw it in a church newspaper that a girl who was my age was at Cambridge. And I was on a gap year. Well, you didn't call it gap year in Grenada. You took a year off to work because your parents thought you were too young to be going. I was 18 or 17 years old when I graduated. And my mom thought it was too much for me to be heading off to a new country. Um, and so she insisted that I worked. I like to pretend it's my choice, but it, it wasn't. <laughs> um, and... Um, I read that she had got into Cambridge and she had four A's. And I said, well, I have four A's. Maybe I should apply. And I just applied. Out of the interview um, schedule, I was in Manchester the next year for a youth parliament. And I told them I was there. They said, why don't you come down? Why don't you interview? I went in there totally unprepared, didn't have any tutoring or coaching. And knowing what I know now about Cambridge, I think it's quite extraordinary that they took a chance on me. Um, I'd like to think that I took a chance on them as well, but um, because it wasn't necessarily the environment that I was expecting when I got there. But I have to say my experience as a whole was, was very positive. In terms of migrating from the Caribbean, yeah. obviously, there are, uh, at Cambridge, obviously, like, I know the demographics are going to be skewed in a particular way. But yeah. What was it like actually being a person from the Caribbean? Because I'm sure there might be people there from or who are Caribbean by heritage, yeah. but having been in Grenada in the in the Windward Islands, migrating and actually being in Cambridge in that environment, yeah. what are some of the the, mo the things that stand out to you most yeah. or stick in your mind most? Well, I remember I hated it when I first started because it was so cold. <laughs> I was freezing all the time and it wasn't a very familiar environment. It was completely new. I hated the food. Um, I just felt that it wasn't seasoned properly. It was all the typical, you know, <laughs> migration <laughs> complaints, you know, the vegetables were boiled to death. You were expected to eat in the buttery. I remember buying my chicken and trying to cook stew chicken. Everybody asked me, what is this? I'm smoking the place up. You know, there was a lot of, you know, cultural, um, humor around it. Um, 
I actually think I might have had an easier time than people who um, were born here, curiously. I think, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe you walked into it a bit blind rather than having 18 years I, of experience. I didn't have a systematic, I didn't know what it really meant to be black, I think, before I moved here. Mm -hmm. I think I knew I was black, but what did it mean to be a minority? I didn't have the minority burden, as I like to call it. Mm -hmm. So I didn't walk around feeling that I was automatically inferior. I walked in there with a whole hell of confidence. I was like, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to do so well and I'm going to show them. You know, I remember someone pulling me aside and saying uh, before I left, oh, don't be, you know, you know, perturbed that, you know, you may not do as well. I know you're usually getting top grades. You know, these are very, very clever people. And I just said to myself, what's she talking about? So I walked in with a supreme level of confidence which I don't think, and I say this as a generalization, that is present necessarily when you grow up in a system where you are a minority and you're not expected. Because the expectation on me was huge. I was expected to do well. I was expected to, you know, to be great. And I think that was the benefit I got from the Grenadian experience. So I was so confident. Um, and, you know, I had to learn how to do things in a different way, but I think it showed. So I think from that perspective, I had a I probably had an easy experience because I walked into it blind and I walked into it just not with the burden of what people in Cambridge were like. I didn't know um, and, you know, anything they said. I had to learn what, you know, what systematic and institutional racism looked like. And once I knew it and I spotted it, it, it did, you know, open my eyes. And, you know, I became involved in things like anti-racism and black students officer. But that was very, I think, late on. I think um, there were actually quite a few people from the Caribbean who had just come. I wouldn't say quite a few, of maybe about five of us. And we're still friends like today, but it felt like a lot. <laughs> it felt like a lot. It felt like it was good enough back mm -hmm. then. And, you know, we had our own ways. We had a Caribbean society. We had, we did dance um, from the Caribbean. I remember my friend's mom used to bring up dance costumes from Trinidad. Um, we had our garden parties, we bought plantains and ate it in each other's rooms. We came down to London for soca fets. So there was there were ways to, you know, to integrate amongst ourselves. We had a soca night in one of the colleges. It was very, very popular. So it was just, you know, it was one of those things that I really ended up enjoying much more than I thought I would. I was going to ask you, how did you get through those initial difficult times but I think what you've yeah. kind of explained really is your your cohesive group that you had which yeah. actually pushed you through those times. Yeah and I actually think I had a very wide network of friends. So I didn't just have Caribbean friends. I remember and I'm really grateful I had um friends from England. I remember when I was feeling homesick, one of my friends, Rachel Heron, she literally organized a non homesick party for me, a dinner. You know, I had re a really, really good support, and they invited me to the drinking society. Um, I joined a church there. You know, I had church friends. Um, I was really, really lucky to be exposed to a very wide network of people. Um, some of my best friends now are people I met through Cambridge. I was involved in the Cambridge student. I was writing for the newspaper, so I met friends there. Some of the top journalists now. Um, who were writing now for The Guardian at the Times. I know them from that experience. Um, and then I went to Paris. And then I had a whole new network of friends again. And they were not necessarily Caribbean people. So I say this to say that sometimes you can think that what you need is your own. And I say this now because we have um, a young... One of my friends her do was there. Her daughter is now at Cambridge. And she initially didn't like it. And I said, give it a chance. You sometimes think that you crave the familiar when... Actually, there's a lot to learn from having a different perspective. And I think it really helps me now. I'm in this environment. I'm probably the most senior black dispute resolution lawyer I know in the city. And there are not a lot of people like me, but I'm completely at ease in business meetings. I'm completely at ease in social settings because I've done it. I've been doing it since I was at Cambridge. Being in an environment where it's... It's, it's, it's not your natural, I would say, habitat. And I think it's very important to learn to be flexible and agile from an early stage. So I say this to people who are considering universities. Don't be put off, you know, because the demographic is not exactly like you. I think you have to look at the, the bigger picture and, and learn to coexist. And at the end of the day, we're all human beings. 
it's a cliche and there are differences but you know we 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 there there's a lot to be gained from knowing and valuing our differences as well oh so what i would get into now is obviously your profession in general yeah like, I'll combine these questions. It might feel a bit full on, but it just gives you the opportunity. Oh, to no, not at all. So the questions that come to my mind are, why law? What is your role now in terms of what you do? Yeah. Because obviously we know yeah. as a name, but what does it actually involve? Entail. Mm-hmm. Entail. And um, what do you love about it, really? Yeah. So why law? Um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do when I was growing up. I knew I wanted to do something international. Um, and I used to say I wanted to be a diplomat, but I don't think I really knew what a diplomat did. Mm. And then I thought I wanted to do something in human rights, but my mom wanted me to be a doctor or dentist, you know, typical Caribbean mm. mom, right? <laughs> yeah. But it was very clear that I had a natural strength and affinity for the arts. Um, I was good at science and I did, you know, math and so right up to A level. But my passion was for the arts and humanities. Um, and law seemed like an amalgam of all the things that I liked, you know, writing, being persuasive, reading lots, anal- analyzing difficult questions, um, coming to a view. It just seemed to, to, to have elements of all the things that I liked. So that's why I chose law. And also for social justice reasons. Um, as I said, I want to be a human rights lawyer. I tried it out a little bit and it wasn't exactly my cup of tea, I felt that I was achieving a lot of social justice by some of the initiatives I'm involved in. We do a lot of human rights cases here, we do climate change cases here, and I felt that that was a good way to do that kind of work, but to have the protection of a corporate institution behind it. So what do I do now? So um, I am a commercial disputes lawyer. I do disputes, general disputes, for typically large companies, sometimes for individuals. Um, I love disputes. I love the analytical side of it. I love the law. I love winning. (laughs) (laughs) I don't like to lose. Um, And I love the sense of resolution that you get when you resolve a dispute, whether you settle it or whether you go to court. I love that, you know, someone has a problem and we've taken care of it. I love problem solving. So that's what I like about the law. Um, What is a daily... What do I do on a day-to-day basis? I tend to do quite a variety of things, and that's also a reason why I like it, because um, from one day, today I could be drafting instructions, or I could be drafting a memorandum on a legal question. Tomorrow I could be having meetings with clients on the questions in in point. I could be mentoring some. I I do a lot more mentoring now that I'm more senior or junior associates. I'm sometimes in management meetings or recruitment meetings, um, interviewing potential recruits. I do quite a lot of that now. Sometimes I'm in court. Um, Sometimes I'm doing an arbitration or I'm preparing documents or filing documents for an arbitration. So it really depends. It's really variable and it gives me a lot of excitement when I look at my calendar for the next day. Um, I do a lot of business development as well, so a lot of lunches, a lot of panels. Um, so it really, it, it really c- depends on what day of the week it is and what time of the day it is. And I think that's what gives me the pep in my step to keep doing this job because I really like it. It, it really allows me to use all of my skill sets and to bring them together in a harmonious way. Okay. Um, not to take a negative route, but is there any cons, anything you would like to change? Oh, no. Uh, there's a lot I would change. Um, and because you like something doesn't mean that it's, necessarily plain sailing. plain sailing yes and I've had challenges I mean I don't want to make it seem as if you know it's all la di da um, nothing is right and um, some things I would change are the hours we work insanely long hours we have very demanding clients um, there's also a culture that I would change I think it's a very macho culture I don't think it's sometimes a very welcoming culture for difference I think working class males I think black um, females I think when you had intersectionality of all of these identities it actually um, is not very usual in the city so I would change that because I would like there to be more opportunities for people like me who didn't necessarily have the skiing water polo background to actually be here and to feel comfortable and to feel confident um, and I'd like to change the working hours in, and to have more flexibility for women like myself you know if you think you're having a family it's very very difficult to do this job and to do it well 
So um, there are things I would change, um, definitely. But it doesn't mean I doesn't I don't like what I do. But I just think the environment in which I practice could um, be shifted and have certain things tweaked or significantly changed, as a matter of fact, about them. One of the questions that comes to mind now is in terms of the children in the Caribbean, because in the UK you tend to have these, they have them in the Caribbean as well, of course, but you know, like an open day, a show mm-hmm, day, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. Ad- advice and whatnot, mm-hmm. but getting it direct from the source and someone that's living it and breathing it right now is key. So my question to you is, if a child in the Caribbean, or even in the UK, it doesn't matter if you're off or everybody, mm-hmm. wanted to get involved in your role, we know hard work is imperative, but what would you in, encourage them to do or advise them to do as some key things that they can probably do by themselves before even getting to mentorship? Yeah, that's a good question. I think I would encourage them to do some research on you know the role and how to get into law because sometimes you find people choosing c- certain A-levels, for instance, that may not be the best A-levels to get into law or to get into a firm like this one. You know, A lot of people choose law as an A-level and law is typically regarded as a soft A-level if you want to... Um, for example, if you go to Cambridge, I don't accept or necessarily like people doing law as an A-level. So it's important to do some research. And I think the best way to do that would be to align yourself, you know, reach out to people like me or reach out to people who you admire or people you know who have been through that experience and ask them for their advice. You know, I think that's the best way to do it. I think also to be agile as well. I think, you know, many people follow a very linear route, but it's important um to recognize that you can have setbacks and you can still um, you can still end up you know being in the city or you can choose a different way as well and still end up working as I do I have a very um, esteemed colleague he went to UE um, he did exceedingly well and then he came to Cambridge he did an LLM he did a PhD and he's now practicing here um, so you can have a different route you don't have to go to Cambridge to be here you, you can go to a different university you can do well in your exams and you don't have to follow someone's route I think directly I think that would be my one of my pieces of advice and I think hard work and determination but most importantly you know be authentic and be passionate about you, what you're choosing a lot of people are choosing things that their parents would like them to do or um, what they think might make them money in the long run or you know um, something that seems very easy. I remember talking to someone about law, and he says, that's too long. I mean, it was someone here, and, you know, it always yeah. stuck to me. It's like, that's too long, man. Yeah, that's no, too no. long. Okay, you know, yeah, it's yeah. too long. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. And, <laughs> yeah, it was just, you know, it. You, you have to choose for the right reasons. And, you know, my niece now, she said to me, oh, I want to be a makeup artist. And I said, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be a makeup artist, but... You do have to take into account, is this something you'd like to do for the next 20, 30, 40 years of your life? Um, you have to realize there's other makeup artists. Everyone now is learning to do makeup on YouTube. You know, what will you do? So I think you make smart decisions. You follow your passions, but at the same time, you take a very um, broad view. And you're willing to listen to other people who've done it as well. Not to be, not to get them to change your mind, but to just to make sure that at this stage in your career, or not career yet, but in your career choices, you're actually making the right decisions and for the right reasons. Okay. So um, one of the things that I always reflect on, just me personally having a great interest in Caribbean history in general, and um, migration is a very Mm -hmm. (coughs) prominent part of Caribbean Mm -hmm. history. And just thinking about the brain drain now, one of Grenada's brightest minds is right here. <laughs> so, no, but I wouldn't say that. No, but, but seriously, um, yeah. well, you obviously would be very, people mm-hmm. would obviously look to your services in Grenada. My thing is, will you ever return to Grenada during your working life? Because the reason why I ask that to a lot of Caribbean people yeah. is that I see certain things sometimes, and I'm not saying just because someone migrates they must know better. It's, it's the actual experience that they pick up along the way, and you've clearly picked up yeah. a lot of experience along the yeah. way. Yeah, I would like to, and I'm currently involved. We have a Caribbean practice here at Deborah Voice. We're actually working on matters um, for Caribbean governments and for our Caribbean companies. And I think the point I'd like to make is that you don't necessarily have to be in the Caribbean to make an impact. Um, and something I toyed with a lot is setting up a diaspora skills network where people are here and can still volunteer to do training or to 
you know, actually lend their services for free to the Caribbean, to governments, to NGOs, to entities, to individuals. Um, I tried putting it on an app actually, um, and it just wasn't financially sustainable to have it as an app. So now I'm looking to do it as a website. But I think the important thing is while you're here, don't wait until some amorphous moment in the future when you have everything lined up in a row and your, all your children will be grown and then you can go back. I think it's too late. So I think the first point I wanted to make is that I am actively looking and I would actively like others to look at what things you can do now um, to help and to assist. But to your question, um, I think it's important and I think I'd love to be able to um, be in Grenada during my working life. Whether it will turn out that way, I mean, I'm excited by all the opportunities that I have in the UK and it's always a question and a dilemma as to whether, you know, I nurture and develop these opportunities but i see it now as the opportunity to really be a sponge and to get all of this lovely experience and skills and resources that i might someday be able to deploy um but the someday part i think you have to convert that into an actionable goal yeah. <laughs> and um it's a question that weighs on me particularly now i have a son as to whether um all my energies and all my passions have been fulfilled in the UK but as for now I think um, I will be in the UK for um, the foreseeable future but I am I would love to be able to spend some of my working life in the Caribbean. Um, I don't know how I'm going to structure this question but sometimes so much is running through my mind I, no, I, I jumble okay. my words but um, instead of looking at the paper I'm going to tell you something that's on my mind right now what's on my mind right now I was having a conversation with somebody yesterday and they're originally from, they were born in Anguilla and mm -hmm. they now live here and they were talking about their, I think their great nieces and nephews because they're quite on an age and they were saying, I don't think these kids growing up are even going to know what Windrush actually is. Mm -hmm. Not saying that Windrush is the only Caribbean migration to mm -hmm. Britain but it's just an example. And my thing is, do you feel personally that the descendants, the British descendants here of the Car of Caribbean parents or grandparents, do you feel they can make a particular impact in the Caribbean if they desire to do so? Or And also, do you think it will be helpful if a lot of these people actually tapped into their roots and see of what opportunities they could actually engage in in the Caribbean? I think it's it's imperative. I mean, at the end of the day, right, there's probably only less than 5,000 Grenadians who were born in Grenada living in the UK, probably less. And I think if we have a sizable diaspora here, I count children of Grenadians, grandchildren of Grenadians, as all essential parts of the diaspora. Um, and to your question, I think it will be very much appreciated and I think what needs to happen is an active route by which we can entice people from the UK um, who are of Grenadian heritage to come back and to make a tangible difference. Um, I know Ghana has a homecoming program. I think there should be a similar program in the Caribbean. Um, obviously, the government is a bit more tight, sh you know, cash trapped. But I think there are other in incentives we can deploy um, to make it an attractive proposition for children and grandchildren of the diaspora. I started um, this summer, at least I had one event, because I was not really happy with the way in which Grenada's 40th anniversary was celebrated. Um, so I had for young professionals and creatives a session where I had um, Grenadian poetry being read and I also had someone who was of that Windrush generation sharing his experience because I think we need to root ourselves in the past to move forward and that was so touching to me because I think it really marked the 40 years of 45 years of Grenada's independence and the 40 years of Windrush in a way that I really envisage it to be and I I have in mind um, and I'm currently in the process of planning a family day in Hyde Park and my aim would be to have Grenadians, and at least those I know and people who are interested, just learning about Grenadian history from the perspective of games. The games we used to play in the Caribbean, there's lots of children's games. 
just to have a family day and you know we have Grenada Day etc it has its purpose but I think it's very much commercial what I would like is for us to have a day of learning more about our history and historical things um, and I think the games are a good place to start because these are things that were handed down in an oral tradition by our parents there's no reason why we can't do the same here and I think because I've had a son now it's just focused my energy on what can I do to make sure that he can maintain his Grenadian-ness together with his Britishness and that duality. Um, you might notice that whenever I'm in the office, I talk with a semi-British accent. It's not a full one. It's a mongrel accent, I call it. But when I'm in Grenada, I speak completely Grenadian, right? And it just comes out. So there is this duality in me, and I think my son would also have this duality. And I'm very careful to tend it in a good way so that he can feel that he can return home and he can and Grenada is home and that he can go back and he can be welcome and appreciated and make a difference. I think what you're doing is very important because I feel that me personally, I think one thing my family is definitely not rich. <laughs> <We're poor. laughs> mm -hmm. But I think one thing I appreciate now is that actually being able to see where my mother Still, something in me that I don't believe this country could have gave to me because they, their perception of Caribbean people here was is is kind of mm -hmm. it, it's it's insane to me, to mm -hmm. me. And, and being able to see it growing up and understanding what I came from and what Caribbean people have done in the in the world, not just in the Caribbean alone. If I hadn't have had that, I probably have a different perception of the Caribbean. So what you're yeah. doing will even be better for him starting off really young and I feel that's a lot of a lot of my generation actually missed out on unfortunately but it happens <laughs> anyway mm. moving on um the last two more questions actually oh, wow. um one piece of advice or something you're grateful for that many people should be grateful for that could be two questions you can answer that in two ways it could be one piece of advice you would give to anyone it could be young old whatever so we'll start with that. Yeah. So one piece of advice, I think, is to be authentic. I think being authentic with people and being authentic with myself has, you know, helped me to achieve my professional goals and my personal goals. Um, and that's what I think is one of the most important things, to have a sense of your own identity and to not to lose that in the you know in the even here in the city you know everyone knows i'm grenadian everyone knows i like oil down everyone knows they don't know what it is but they know i like oil down um <laughs> and everyone knows that i'm proud of the caribbean and, and you know i i i i'm fully and authentically caribbean in myself and um i think that has helped me it hasn't hindered me so that's the one piece of advice um, and things that I'm grateful for, for life, for love, for friends, family, nothing material. I mean, I'm grateful for material things as well, but I think the order I've mentioned it is just, you know, my fundamental belief for life, my love, my family, my friends. Um, those are the most important things to me and creating an environment and being able to do things to create an environment where we can all thrive. I think those are the things that I'm grateful for. The very last question before we move on to you know what I've already explained is what do you want your legacy to be because you're clearly making an impact as far as I can see. Well I hadn't thought so much of legacy um, and I think it's I'm probably a bit too I mean I'm, I'm getting way older than I'd care to admit but I'm getting a bit well, older yeah. to think about <laughs> legacy right but I think I'd like to be remembered for caring for others. Um, and leaving the world in a better place from a social justice perspective than I met it. Um, things like identity, and in the UK here, the identity of black children and sense of self. I think I'd like, you know, I read Bernard Code's book on, you know, the education system and black boys, and I'm just appalled that not a lot has been done since then. So I think. It would be fantastic for me. I've set up a mentoring initiative um, here in law, in the city. I think if I could do more things like that, 
and for them to be successful and to continue and actually to effect change where we have more people like me where I'm not just the only one. I would consider my life to have been a failure if five years, ten years from now, there's still just one black Caribbean lawyer in the city of London. Um, I want to bring others with me. And so I think that, you know, caring for others and creating a pathway for other people. Because um, as you said, I might have to go back to Grenada. Mm. <laughs> so um, I think it's very, very important. I say this jokingly, but I think it's very important to open up the way so that more people can benefit in the same way I have. And that's a perfect way to end the first part. So thank you very much. Great. I think I paid something stupid, like a thousand pounds for the ticket, but it was worth it. I cried and it was brilliant because my country got a gold medal. It's, you know, it, it, it was really worth it. Saraka! We had Saraka. We call it Salaka, actually, where I was from. And it's a great celebration. It's where you get a, a banana leaf and you put all the food and then they would put a dinner mint on.